The book of Revelation pictures three angels speeding to our planet. They carry urgent messages of warning and hope to prepare us for Jesus' return. These divine prophecies provide us with a vivid window revealing future events for our world. In God's word, a special blessing is promised for all who seek to understand these prophecies. With this in mind, Amazing Facts brings you a new revelation with Doug Batchelor. Author and TV host Doug Batchelor has thrilled thousands around the world with these fascinating presentations. This new revelation seminar is a complete Bible study the whole family will enjoy. Clear-cut logic, spontaneous humor, and beautifully illustrated study guides will bring the Bible to life as never before. Today's message, the big radar has caught you. And now, a new revelation. Why does everyone say Jesus is coming soon? What is soon? It could be 50 to 75 years from now, and wouldn't God want to wait until more people are ready? Why would he want to come when there are still so few believers? Well, the Lord has waited pretty long already. The Bible tells us there in 2 Peter chapter 3, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but he's long-suffering to us word. When will the day come when there's nobody else? In other words, when everybody's ready. That time will not come, Jesus tells us. But you know what's happening? With the final events of prophecy, the Lord, through circumstances, is going to force everybody to get off the fence, and people will be making decisions on one side or the other, and then the Lord will come. Uh, I want the Lord to come soon, don't you? Amen. Now, I've got, let me take that back. I have kind of uh, mixed emotions on that. If he comes too soon, some people I love aren't ready. But uh, as far as wanting to get out of the world, I'll just tell you, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And uh, I, want to, I want to go home. I want to be in a world where there's no more pain and sorrow and no bad headlines, just good news all the time. And so I want Jesus to come. And though it's true, the Bible says folks have talked about his coming being soon for so long, it's going to happen. I promise you. You know, when he came the first time, the children of Israel had sort of grown weary of looking for the Messiah to come. When he finally did come, they were not ready. They'd gone to sleep. That's happening to the church too. Friends, he, Jesus said, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. He's going to come very, very soon. So we have to be ready all the time. Be ready all the time. Let me grab my Bible here. Go sure. Ahead. Will we sleep in heaven? Will we get tired and need to sleep? Well, the Bible says you'll run and not be weary. It seems to indicate in the Scripture there will be divisions of time. The night will not be as dark as the night is now. I think there'll be a beautiful glow all the time. Any of you uh, been in the far north in the summertime when the sun never really goes down? You can read a newspaper at midnight. That's kind of how I think heaven will be at the darkest hour. And then during the daytime, the sun will be seven times brighter than what we have here. Um, we may rest, but it won't be a rest from fatigue. We'll rest just to rejoice and revel in God's creation. But I don't think we'll get tired and sleep like we do now because there'll be no fatigue. Are we breaking the third commandment when we say, God bless you, when someone sneezes? Well, I don't think so. I mean, the idea of the third commandment is do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Asking the Lord to bless a person who may uh, be demonstrating some illness is, uh, I would not say that's taking God's name in vain. You don't want to be frivolous with God's name. Uh, it's the most sacred name. But I would not think that saying God bless you is breaking the third commandment. If you believe there is life... But, pardon me, dear. If you say you're a Christian and you live like the devil, you are taking God's name in vain. That's what it means. You take his name. Like a woman who marries a man, takes the name, she's a married bachelor. She took my name. Now, when you take somebody's name and then you end up with somebody else, you're taking their name in vain. That's the main way that commandment is abused. Taking the name of Christ, saying you are one of his children, and then living like you're not. If you believe there is life on other planets, do you believe organisms from other planets will be in the new Jerusalem on Earth? Uh, organisms? Well, you mean uh, uh, intelligent life? Um, I just read them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I do believe. See, right now, I think our planet has been quarantined because of sin. Uh, let me give you some, some scriptures. The Bible said it's through Christ that Jesus made, that the, uh, through Christ the Father made the worlds, plural. 
Um, the Bible tells in the book of Job how there was a heavenly meeting. Sons of God come to present themselves before the Lord. Satan comes also. God said, where did you come from? Job chapter 1. He said, I came from the earth. This meeting is taking place with the, God, the leaders of other worlds that are meeting with the Father. And Satan comes to represent this world. How many of you remember the parable where Jesus said a shepherd had 100 sheep, 99 made it safe back to the fold, one was lost. He left the 99 safe there in the wilderness in the fold, went in pursuit of that one lost sheep. How many people in this world have sinned? Everybody. So that parable doesn't apply to this world because everyone's sinned, everyone's lost here, but this world is like that lost sheep. Jesus has hundreds of unfallen, maybe thousands of unfallen worlds, creatures that uh, you and I cannot comprehend, all of them beautiful. Uh, some are more intelligent than others, just like in our world. But this planet rebelled, and he left all that and came to save this one lost sheep, this world. So yes, I believe that once we're there, we'll be able to travel through infinite space and, and visit the other planets. And maybe they'll want to come visit us. They probably will. You know why? The Bible says, from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh, that word translates all life, come to worship before the Lord. God is going to move the capital of the universe to our planet after the millennium. All will come to worship here. So I would think, yes, you're going to get to meet some extraterrestrials, I guess you'd call them. Okay. Who was Cain's wife? I know why this question comes in every program. I get this question. Cain killed Abel. Abel ran off with his wife. And you say, wait, Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, where'd the wife come from? Well, if you keep reading there, I think it's in Genesis chapter 4 or 5, it says Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Now, back in the early ages of our world's history, it was not considered incest for a man to marry his sister. The reason that became dangerous by the time of Moses is because of the degeneration of the genes and sin. Intermarriage caused um, weak bloodlines. You've heard of the blue bloods of Europe? That's because there was so much intermarriage. Some of them became hemophiliacs. Um, but Abraham married his half-sister. Uh, Jacob married his cousin. Isaac married his cousin. It was not considered a problem until later. Cain married his sister. And for that matter, who did Adam marry? Wasn't Eve from the same parents? His sister. Scary thought, right? You'll need this. Okay. Please explain Peter's vision of unclean foods. Okay, get comfortable, dear. This you didn't may bring take me a chair. I'll get you a stool. Okay. Here. Um, Acts chapter 10, I don't have time to read the whole thing, but let me see if I can abbreviate just a little bit. Read Acts chapter 10 and 11 if you want to understand this. I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version to cover more questions. For the first three and a half years after the cross, the disciples did not preach to the Gentiles. They went exclusively to the Jews. It was not until the stoning of Stephen they started preaching to the Gentiles. The Lord had to impress on them in a very dramatic way that the gospel was intended to go to everybody. Even the apostles had not grasped this. There was a godly centurion, a Roman. He was an Italian named Cornelius. He was praying. An angel appeared. He said, you send your servants to a man named Simon Peter who's in Joppa. He'll come and tell you what you're supposed to do. You know, instead of the angel telling Cornelius, God uses people to tell people, doesn't he? Well, Peter's on the roof of the house. He's praying, the girls are getting lunch ready, and he has a vision. This vision appears where a great sheet tied at the four corners is descending from the heaven by a cord, evidently, and the sheet is full of all kinds of creeping, unclean animals that every Jew loathed. And then a voice from heaven says, Arise, kill, and eat. Now, Peter had never eaten anything common or unclean. He even says that he said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Notice this. That vision takes place three times. Three times God says, arise, kill, and eat. Three times Peter says, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Then the sheet goes up to heaven, and Peter's wondering, what does the vision mean? Peter never took anything out of the sheet. Some people say this vision proves that God has cleansed all foods. The vision had nothing to do with food. Peter explains the vision later. He says, God has shown me through this vision not to call any man unclean. As soon as the vision was over, some messengers came from this Gentile and said, come preach the gospel to us. The purpose of the vision was not saying that Peter could eat anything that hops, swims, or flies. 
The purpose of the vision was to say the gospel was to go to the Gentiles because the Jews thought the Gentiles were unclean. He said, God has shown me not to call any man, M-A-N, interesting way to spell pig. God has shown me not to call any man unclean. Notice this, does Peter ever take anything out of the sheet? No. Does Peter say, I have never eaten anything common or unclean? Some people say Jesus cleansed all foods. Well, how come three and a half years later, Peter still has never eaten anything unclean? No, Jesus did not clean unclean foods. Your, God still cares about you just like you care for your children. Okay. This is a, this is a, a long question. This person has, has had made a choice to have an abortion before she was a Christian, and she's asked the Lord to forgive her, but her problem is she can't seem to forgive herself, and she needs to know how she can get peace. Okay, I, I've had a few questions similar to this. I thought maybe it'd be wise to include this because a number of people here, perhaps, and those watching at home have struggled with bad decisions. This represents all kinds of bad decisions we've made. I've made some decisions I wish I could go back in time and undo. We do and say things that we're ashamed of. Amen? You know, God is merciful. There's only one sin in the Bible that is identified as unforgivable. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That means all the other sins are forgivable. And they're not forgiven by penance and beating ourselves. They're forgiven by faith in Jesus' sacrifice. Now, if God says that if we confess and forsake our sins, if we are genuinely sorry, if we repent... If we confess and forsake our sins, he promises to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to forgive us. If God is going to forgive us and cast our sins into the depths of the sea, what right do we have not to forgive ourselves? Maybe you'd find some relief in remembering that that old person that made those bad decisions has been dead and buried and crucified with Christ. They've got what they deserve. And if you are crucified with Christ, then you are a new creature. You're born again. You're innocent. You're a baby. It's a new life. You are a new life. And so you can go on from day to day thanking the Lord for his forgiveness. Do not dwell on the past. Sometimes the devil will remind you of your past failures to discourage you. And you can't prevent the birds from flying over your head, but you don't have to let them nest in your hair. You don't have to dwell on those things, okay? When those thoughts come and you think, oh, Lord, why did I do that? Say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me and go on. Amen? Amen. We have a very good study tonight. It, it's different from some of the other studies, but we really thought it would be important to include this. The title of the lesson is The Big Radar Has Caught You. And this time it's really serious. Kind of foreboding title, isn't it? This is dealing with surrender to the Lord and obedience. A very important issue. Some people come to a Revelation seminar like this and they think that salvation is in knowing things. Nobody's going to get to heaven because they knew what the mark of the beast was. You know what? The devil knows what the mark of the beast is. It's not going to save him. It is important to know something about how Jesus is come, coming and the imminence of his coming. It's, under, it's, it's important to understand things about the millennium and the chronology there in final events. And it's very refreshing to read through the prophecies and understand them, and you will. But I've done you a great disservice if I give you all that information without stressing the importance of a personal commitment and surrender to your Savior. Because all I'm doing, if I give you information without encouraging you to submit to the Lord of the Bible, I'm creating problems for you in the judgment day. You know why? To whom much is given much is required. And if you're coming to the meetings just because you are tickled by information but you have no intention of following the Lord, then you probably ought to pack up and get out right now because these things will be glaring at you in the judgment. God will say, you knew this information. To whom much is given, much is required. Even Jesus said, he who knew his master's will and did not do it will be beaten with many stripes. He who did not know his master's will will be beaten with few stripes. And so, friends, it's important for us to not only understand prophecy and revelation, we're going to get into some heavy things. Some of the things I'm going to share are going to be mind-blowing. Some of them are going to be very earth-shaking. Some of them will shake your personal foundations. Some of them will shake things that you've maybe believed for years, misconceptions. And if you do not have a personal commitment to Jesus, then 
your house will be swept away when the storm comes. That's why at this point, before we go any farther, I am stressing surrender to the Lord. Surrender to the Lord means a willingness to listen to Him and obey Him. Question number one. Does God really see and take note of me personally? Is God aware of each one of us personally? The Bible tells us that God is aware of our down-sittings and our uprisings. He watches over us with a jealous eye. The Lord watches over us because He watches over the flowers that bloom and the sparrows. God is aware of every DNA molecule in every blade of grass, in every field, in every planet throughout the cosmos. Do you think He's not aware of you? Would you be unaware of something you died to redeem? Would you give your life for something that you were not aware of? Oh, you bet he's aware of you. He is intensely interested in you and your life. The very fact you're still breathing, that your heart is beating right now is because God has provided for you through your life and he's taking note of you personally. And he wants a relationship with you personally. You might think, with all the people in the world, does God really care whether I notice him? You know, because God is God and He loves like God, He hurts like God too. He wants you to love Him. He does not want to feel rejection. And when, when we ignore God, when we go from day to day and never notice Him, even though He's supplying all of our needs, it hurts Him. It wounds Him. He wants to have a love relationship with each one of us. He made us to be loved and to love us. How do you think a parent feels well, I've seen it happen so many times. I'll tell you how they feel. I've got a family, real stubborn, driven people. My mother and her mother fought for nine years and they didn't talk. And every time I'd, I, you know, had to go see grandma, and then I'd come home and see mom, and whenever I'd see grandma, she'd start crying. What's the matter with your mother? How come she doesn't call me? I took care of her. I loved her. She'd start sobbing and crying. It just broke her heart. Nine years wondering. I had this child, I provided for them, I just wanted some love. And I've seen it in earthly relationships. I've seen it in marriages where wives just want a little love and attention from their husbands, but their husbands never notice them. It's typically it's that way more than the other. How do you think God feels when every day He's providing everything we need, every cell of life is, is activated by God and we don't think about him, but just a couple of passing references in the morning or before we drop off to sleep at night. He wants to walk with us through the day. Amen? Amen? He knows you. He's aware of you personally, and he wants you to be aware of him. There's an excellent book I'd like to recommend. It's very old. It's called Practicing the Presence of God. When we can master being aware of God's presence, then you know what it means to abide in Christ. Question number two. Can I be saved in his kingdom without obeying his word as found in the Holy Bible? Not if you know what his word says. Now, I've made it very clear God judges us according to what we know. This is going to come up later in the lesson, but I want you to turn to a scripture. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10. It's uh, just before the book of Revelation. Actually, a few books before Revelation. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation that shall devour the adversaries. If we sin willfully. Now, is there a difference between willful and unwillful sin? It's saying if we deliberately sin after God has given us a knowledge of the truth, that's pretty dangerous. We're thumbing our noses at God even though He's told us what His will is. And for us to say that He's our Lord when we're not obeying His orders is a sham. The Bible says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? That's what Jesus said. And again, John says, if we say we know Him and do not keep His commandments, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. That's the Bible, friends. If you don't want to know the truth, then don't come. But I'm going to tell you what the Bible really says. It's not necessarily popular, but it's the Bible. For us to say, we love the Lord, we know the Lord, and not obey the Lord is hypocrisy. Can I be saved when I deliberately, after I know what His Word says, go against His Word? No. The Lord tells us in the judgment there will be many 
don't ever forget the words many and few. Jesus said, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Broad is the way and wide is the gate that goes to destruction, and many. Many means majority. The majority of Christian people who take the name of Christ will come to him in the judgment and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we taught in your streets? Haven't we cast out devils? Many, done many wonderful works? And they think uh, this religious behavior is a substitute for personal surrender. And the Lord says, I do not know you. Now, you know when the Lord says he wants to know us, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. The word know in the Bible has a very intimate connotation. The Bible says Adam knew his wife. They had a baby. No represents like marriage. Very close relationship, very intimate, very personal. Jesus said he wants to know us. He wants to have a personal relationship with us. And you know what's more? He does want to reproduce, you and him, reproduce other Christians. Through your relationship, being filled with his spirit, other Christians are born. He wants to be married to us. We're the bride. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. That's a very intimate love relationship. And for people to say, oh, yeah, I know the Lord, but they're not submitting to the Lord, he says, no, I don't really know you. Number three, why does God require obedience? Why is it necessary? Well, it's because he doesn't want us to have any fun. You know, that's what I said. When I was up there in the cave and I started reading the Bible and I looked at the claims of the gospel, and I want you to keep in mind, friend, Keep in mind, friends, I had never been to church. When I first started reading about Jesus, oh, well, that's not true. I mean, I was forced to go to church in some military schools I went to and things, but I was not a churchgoer. I didn't hear very many sermons. And uh, when I started reading the Bible, just from reading the Bible, I knew there were things in my life that needed changing. And, oh, you should have seen me wrestle. I was smoking, drinking, lying. I was having relationships with young ladies I was not married to, cursing, stealing, doing a lot of things wrong. And I started reading the Bible. I started thinking, oh, man, I'll probably have to quit drinking because I knew my drinking was not appropriate. And I thought, I'd like to be a Christian, but I don't want to quit drinking. Christians don't have any fun. So God said, I won't stop you. Drink. God doesn't force us, does he? Well, I kept on drinking, reading my Bible and drinking. And I'd wake up in jail and not know how I got there. Or I'd wake up and find out I had wrecked somebody's car in reverse. Jaguar, XKE. Or I'd wake up and find out that I had made a fool out of myself. Or I'd wake up and, of course, throw up the whole next day. Or I'd wake up and find out that I'd done something to hurt somebody I cared about. And then I heard a little still, small voice say, Are you having fun? And it started to dawn on me, God, as a loving Father, only wants me to give up what hurts me. God does not want us to give up anything good. I'm going to say that again. Tattoo it inside your brain. God will never ask you to give up anything good. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly, is what the Bible tells us. The only thing he's going to take from you are the things that hurt you because he is a loving Heavenly Father. He wants you to be happy. Look at the Garden of Eden. Everything he gave Adam and Eve was paradise. Good, good, very good. Pleasures at his right hand forevermore. God wants you to have abundant life, real happiness, but sin will not make you happy. And then I read in the Bible, it's not what goes in a man's mouth that defiles him, but it's what comes out of his mouth. I said, oh, good, I can keep drinking and smoking. It's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a man. And I knew when I said it that it wasn't true. I was twisting the Scripture to satisfy my lusts. And then I noticed that what went in the mouth affected what came out. And when I drank, what went in the mouth affected what came out of the mouth. And when I smoked, my breath tasted like an ashtray. I'd be driving along, I'd drop the head of the cigarette in my lap and nearly kill myself, spend my last dollar on tobacco when I had nothing to eat because I was an addict. It's pretty pitiful when you're walking down the road, you have no food, you find $2 and you buy cigarettes with it because you're an addict. It's really, and some people do that with alcohol. And the Lord said, Doug, are you having fun? Little by little, it began to sink in that God wanted me to turn away from the things that hurt me. Now, friends, I've got an announcement. A lot of young people here, this is a university. If you hang around with me when I'm in Sacramento, 
you cannot keep up with me because I have so much fun. Very few people have as much fun as me. I hit the ground having fun, and I go to sleep exhausted from so much fun at the end of the day, but I don't have a guilty conscience. Christians have an abundant life, a full life, and we do all kinds of fun things. No hangovers, no bad breath. That's the, that's the way it is for the Christian. God only wants you to give up the things that hurt you. That's why he wants you to obey because he's a loving parent and the devil's out there to destroy you as a roaring lion. Number four, why does God permit disobedience to continue? Why not destroy sin and sinners now? The Lord is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish. You know, something interesting, when you study the kings of Israel, any of you have read the books of Kings and Chronicles there, First and Second Samuel? It's a favorite subject of mine. You look at how long they reigned. Do you know which king reigned the longest of any? Was Manasseh. You know which king got the reputation for being the most wicked of any king? Manasseh. Talking about kings of Judah. Made his children pass through the fire brought idols into the house of the Lord, killed Isaiah the prophet. Tradition tells us had him put in a log and sawed in half. Manasseh, wicked, wicked king. Had a good father, Hezekiah. Had a good son, Josiah. But he was a mess. He reigned 55 years. And you think, why didn't God snuff him out? Doesn't God have the power? You know why? Manasseh repented in his old age. He came back to the Lord. He took the, temp the idols out of the temple. God knew that there were still some redeemable qualities in that wicked man's heart. Why is the Lord so patient? Because he's desperate to save as many as he can. Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I hope you're learning new things from today's study. If you are, I'd like very much to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, your comments, and especially your prayer requests. Our office staff at Amazing Facts gathers every day to pray over each one of them. If you'd like to know more about how to obtain this video series, you can call us or write. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. And our toll-free number is... 1-800-835-6906. Why don't you give us a call or write us a letter? God bless you, and I thank you in advance. Number five, will God actually destroy the disobedient? What's the Bible say? God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved to judgment. All the wicked will, be, will he destroy in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, from cover to cover in the Bible, friends, it's clear. Those who persist, listen to me now, those who persist in rebelling against God would not be safe in heaven. He has no choice. They would bring their rebellious attitudes there. Don't miss this principle. Salvation and transformation takes place in this life. If God could wave a magic wand when he comes and give you a loving heart, he'd just wait until he came. But whatever changes you make as far as being converted and loving the Lord have to take place now. God is not going to give you a loving heart when he comes. We need to get the loving heart, the new covenant heart from Jesus now. Because if he takes you to heaven with a rebellious heart, you'll start the problem all over again, and he's not going to let that happen. So he has no alternative but to destroy sin and sinners. Let me illustrate with a, a story. Imagine for a moment that you and your spouse live on a beautiful tropical paradise in the South Pacific somewhere. A little island with all the lush fruit and fresh water and waving coconut trees in the breeze. But you're on an island. 
and you have 10 children. You have a paradise. <clears throat> and uh, then one of your children, for some unknown reason, contracts a very painful, slow, contagious, debilitating disease that very, like leprosy, slowly takes you apart, piece by piece, writhing in pain. And it's contagious. And the island is so small that if you allow that child to live, your whole family will be infected. And you've got to choose. Do I toss this child to the sharks in order to save the others, or do I let it stay because I love it and we all die? How'd you like to make that decision? You know, there have been some families that were in lifeboats when a boat went down and there wasn't enough room in the lifeboat for everyone in the family. And someone had to decide who goes overboard. The father thought, if I go overboard, the children will not survive. Having to pick one of your children to throw overboard. Terrible decision to make. This is what God was faced with. He's got this world that he loves, but we've got a disease called sin that is contagious. It's deadly and it's killing us and sinners are not even happy. Well, you know what God did? The Lord took the disease himself. I understand during the Dark Ages, you've heard of the bubonic plague. They didn't know it then, but they know now there's really only one cure for the bubonic plague. It's to get a blood transfusion, some plasma, from a person who was exposed but did not succumb. You know, there's only one person who ever came to our world that never sinned. And that's Jesus. And for us to survive the sin epidemic in this world, we all need a transfusion of his blood to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen? That's the only solution, friends. Because anything else, if God allows us into heaven with his disease, we would spread misery and death everywhere. Number six, I want to obey all of God's rules. How can I be certain I'll not overlook one? Now, I've got to be careful not to leave you with a legalistic impression of, of what God is like. God works in your life like building a house. He will not ask you to do what you are incapable of doing. God leads us in steps. In other words, when I first came to the Lord, I told you just a minute ago, I mean, not only was I running around naked up in the mountains, eating out of a garbage can, long hair and a beard, Drinking, smoking, stealing, lying, cursing, living immorally, just using drugs, everything I could do wrong. When I said, Lord, come into my heart, do you think all of those chains fell off at once? Being a Christian, being sanctified, now God accepted me right then. I was justified when I came to him. Then he began sanctifying me. That's a different process. Notice the word process. Isaiah chapter 1 says, learn to do good. Being a Christian is a learning process. You do not spend 17 years, in my case, or 30 or 20 years in your case, whatever it might be, learning how to do wrong and then all of a sudden know how to do right one day because you've asked Jesus into your heart. You've got to learn a new way of talking, a new way of doing everything. You're becoming a new creature. It takes some time to learn these things. Do not get discouraged if you don't see the house go up in one day. Do any of you men ever build a house? I've built a few houses. When you think of all the nails you need to drive and all the boards you need to cut and all the measurements you need to make in building a house, it can be discouraging. But if instead of worrying about all the things you've got to do, you get a string and a couple of stakes and you pace it off and you tie off the measurements and then you start digging the foundation footings, then you mix up the concrete, one day at a time you start watching it come together. It's been kind of interesting conducting this big evangelistic meeting in this church that's being expanded like this. It's been fun to come every day and say, hey, look, the, they got the roof on, they got the wall done. Uh, little by little, we're moving all the time because the building is changing one brick at a time, one bucket of cement at a time. That's what it's like becoming like Christ, one day at a time. You look at him, you follow him, and you continue to grow. Do not worry about changing everything all at once because we can be overwhelmed by that. Now, I'm not saying God's not able to do that. I don't want to undervalue God's power. How do I follow the Lord? Be willing to follow whatever he presents to you. At one point in my experience, God said, Doug, you've got to quit drinking. For me, drinking was something, and the drugs had to come first because I was having trouble comprehending the gospel while I was still drinking and using drugs. A little later came the smoking. That was a lesser drug. See what I'm saying? 
I'm not saying it's good for you, but I was able to still read my Bible while I was smoking a cigarette. When I got drunk, I couldn't understand my Bible. So God had a series of steps He led me on, one step at a time. See what I'm saying? Somewhere along the way, Doug said, the Lord said, Doug, you need to do something about your language. I had a really foul mouth. My grandmother, you'd be amazed, my sweet little Jewish grandmother, she can embarrass a sailor with her language. Just, I'm serious, it's amazing. She came to church one time and got a hold of the microphone. <laughs> they didn't know my grandma. And she just made everyone blush. In church. It's just part of her vocabulary. Well, that I had inherited some of that from my mom and my dad and my grandma. When I became a Christian, I noticed that all of a sudden I just didn't feel right saying all those words. And it was amazing. I asked the Lord into my heart, said, God, help me. All you have to do is ask God to help you. And all of a sudden, I'd be talking to my friends, and I'd get ready to say one of those words that was just part of my regular vocabulary, and it was like I had power breaks on my tongue. All of a sudden, I'd go, Bleh. and I'd find another word. And all these times, I had been using God's name carelessly. What? It would just stop. And it's like, I said, wow, that's unreal. That had never happened to me before. I never even thought twice. The Holy Spirit was telling me, uh -uh. if you ask him, he'll help you. Little by little, he'll change you. Does God expect us to obey what he reveals to us? What's the answer? Absolutely, friends. Why do you think he's showing you? Every commandment you obey has a blessing added to it. Did you hear me? Every commandment you obey has a blessing connected with it. If you learn the blessing about paying tithe, you'll be prospering. That's the blessing. If you learn to honor your father and mother, your days will be long on the land. You want to have a long life? Don't be disrespectful to your parents. If you want to find rest in Jesus, the Sabbath day says, is a time of rest, spiritual and physical. I mean, you go through each of the commandments, there's a blessing connected with the obedience. When you disobey, there's consequences. Number seven, does God count me guilty for disobeying Bible truth that's never been made clear to me? Yes and no. Now, we're not accountable for what we don't know, but you read, turn with me in your Bibles to Hosea, Chapter 4, I believe it is, verse 6. The book of Hosea is in the Old Testament, just past the book of Daniel. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will forget thy children. Pretty glaring statement. Now, Lord, it doesn't sound fair that you destroy people for lack of knowledge. Keep reading, because you have rejected knowledge. It's not just that they don't know. Some people reject knowledge. Now, there are some people who will not be judged the same way that we're judged because they had no opportunity to know. But not only are we accountable for what God does show us because He loves us, some of us, we start hearing the truth. We know where the truth is. We don't want to look at the instructions. We don't want to hear. We plug our ears and turn away from hearing the Lord. Well, you might say, I didn't know. Ignorance is bliss. Well, but you could have known and you didn't want to. Some people are rejecting knowledge. They're deliberately ignorant. And that's different too, isn't it? It's like when the manufacturer gives you the instructions in the box and you send back the mechanism and say it didn't work. And they say, did you read the instructions? Uh, no, I thought I could just wing it. Got done putting it together. You got all these spare parts, you know. Who's responsible? You are the manufacturer. You're guilty. They gave you instructions. You refuse to look. God has given us instructions too. Amen? We have a responsibility to make ourselves acquainted with what His will is because in the judgment, we're not only accountable for what we do know, we're accountable for what we know we could have known, but we were too indifferent and lazy. Question number eight. But God isn't particular about obedience in every point and small details, is He? Do little things matter to the Lord? Jesus said... Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God is not frivolous. God does not put fluff between the lines. He means what he says. And every word of God is there for our blessing. The little things do matter to God. You look in the Bible and you can see a number of examples where little things made a big difference. Number nine. When I discover new truth, I wait until all obstacles are removed before embracing it. Isn't this best? This is best, isn't it? In other words, to wait until all the obstacles are removed before you obey. Friends, don't ever forget this. Everybody listening, everybody at home, if you're waiting 
until it's convenient to follow Jesus, you will never follow Jesus because the devil will see to it it's never convenient. How many times have you known someone that said, I'm going to quit smoking, I'm going to quit drinking, uh, this is not a good week, I've got a lot of stress, uh, maybe my birthday, eight months from now. Then their birthday comes, they said, this isn't good, got a lot of stress, maybe New Year's Day. And people keep waiting until it's going to be ideal, the devil will see to it, it's never ideal. Ah, uh, not a good time to start a diet right now because it's Thanksgiving. Then after Thanksgiving, not a good time to start a diet, it's Christmas. If you wait until it's convenient, you'll never do it, whatever it is. You know what I'm talking about? Jesus said, whoever would come after me, let him deny himself daily, take up his cross and follow me. There is a personal self-denial. You cannot wait until it gets easy, friends. You got to just get up and go where you're at. Amen? Let me tell you something else about following Jesus. I, I look at my clock. I see I'm running out of time, but I want to say these things. It's so important. I have found that following Jesus is the opposite of following the devil. That's, of course, a profound statement. You already knew that. What I meant by that is the devil will give you the pleasure now and the penalty later. The Lord says there will be trouble in initially making a decision to follow me, but then the blessing follows immediately after. The devil says, buy the car now, feel the steering wheel, smell the leather seats, drive it, then pay for it long after it's at the junkyard, right? Buy now, pay later. God says, pay now and then be free. Get it over with. When I lived up in the cave, I used to wash in the water. That I had a pool right outside my cave. It was very convenient. And in the summer, it was nice to take a dip. In the winter, the water came from melted snow. And you felt born again after every bath. It was cold. And you know, I, I'll be honest with you, friends. Sometimes I would come and I'd stand at the edge. I'd get on this rock. I had a 10-foot deep pool. I used to, you know, go swim and dive in off the rocks around the pool. And I'd say, boy, I probably ought to take a bath. You know, we always feel a little better after a bath. But I knew it hurt initially. And I'd go through a ritual several days in a row sometimes where I'd look at the water and I'd, if I put my toe in, that would never work because every nerve in my body would go, alert, alert, don't do this. The only way to do it was just to jump in. And I'll confess there were a few times I'd kind of, and I go, I can make it another day. You know, and then, <laughs> and then I'd feel a little grubby. For 24 hours, I'd feel grubby. But then eventually I'd get the courage and in a moment of madness, I'd leap. Of course, in midair, I go, no, wait. <laughs> I go crashing off into that frigid Arctic water. And by the time I came out, now I'm numb. You could soap all up and get back in and rinse off. It was much easier at that point. Then the rest of the day, and you know, when I'd come out of the water, I mean, my heart was racing so fast, I'd be pink all over because the water was so cold. I finally built a sauna, and I used to go from the sauna to the cold water, and that made it a lot easier. But I'd feel so good the rest of the day. You know, that's the way it is with the Lord. Sometimes the initial decision is a tremendous battle. But then once you make the decision, oh, you feel so much better after you recover from the shock. <laughs> so if you're going through that battle, friends, do it. Go for it. And you'll be glad you did. But isn't full obedience an impossibility for a human being? Well, that's a question a lot. Of, well, Doug, nobody's perfect. Let me ask you something. How many of you agree that the devil can tempt you to sin? Does everyone here believe the devil can get us to break God's law? Okay, how many here think that God can help you keep his law? Will someone please explain, name one of the commandments that Jesus is not powerful enough to help you obey? Is there such a commandment? Why is it we give the devil more credit than Christ? Now, I'm not claiming to have arrived, but I believe that God is able to keep us from falling. You know what I think it means to be perfect as a Christian? I don't think it means we turn into stainless steel, sterile robots that never have any flaw or defect. I think it means we come to the place where we love God so much, we'd rather die than knowingly hurt Him. Let me say it again. A perfect Christian is someone who loves the Lord so much, he'd rather die than hurt Him and disobey Him. You know the story of Daniel? He loved God so much, he would rather die than go to the lion's den. Daniel had Christian perfection. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They love the Lord so much they'd rather go to the fiery furnace than dishonor God. That's the relationship I want. How about you, friends? If they can have it, you can have it. Yes, you can. God has not changed. Amen? God is able to keep you from falling. The reason some of us don't ever have that experience is we do not let go and let God have control. 
Question number 11. What happens to a person who willfully and knowingly continues to live in disobedience? I read this to you. If we sin willingly after we know the truth, there's no more sacrifice. I think we keep waiting and waiting and waiting, and that's probably the one word that's going to fill the lake of fire is procrastination. We're waiting for it to be convenient. We never really let go and let God. I heard about this man that wanted to be filled with the Spirit, and he was going through a lot of personal spiritual struggle. And he was praying that he could be filled with God, and so he, he put the words up on his wall, let God, meaning let God have control. And he'd kneel and he'd look at those words and he'd pray and say, Lord, I want to let you have control. I want to surrender everything. I don't know how to do it. And he just kept praying and day after day. Finally, one day, uh, he was there kneeling and the wind blew his door closed and the door slammed and the wall shook a little bit and one of the letters fell off his sign and it read, let go. And it finally dawned on him, that's what his problem was. Surrender is not, it's the only battle you win by giving up. You just say, Lord, I quit. Here I am. I'm yours. That's when you win. That's what Peter did after denying Jesus. He finally surrendered. He gave up. That's what John the apostle did when Jesus washed his feet. He finally surrendered. You know how they catch monkeys? You ever heard about this? I, I, think, I, I think it's in Sumatra or in Madagascar, or maybe both. They trap monkeys by taking a coconut. They cut a little hole in the coconut just big enough to get the monkey's hand in when it's open. And in the coconut, they put the monkey's favorite food, rice or something, the mon and then they stake the coconut, they chain the coconut to a stake. The monkeys come down, they'll wait until two or three of them come down, they put their hands in these coconuts, they get a handful of rice, and then they, try, they make a fist, and they, try, and they can't get their hand back out. The little greedy monkeys will not let go. And they are so intense on making their fist and not letting go of what they've got that the captors only need to come up and grab them. You and I are sometimes easy prey for the devil because we will not let go of the trap. It's not that the trap won't let go of us, as we will not let go. Heard about an eagle one time up by Niagara Fall, Falls. Saw a great big salmon that had jumped and landed on an ice floe. And the eagle came down and put its talons into the salmon and started eating on it. Well, then the eagle evidently understood from its pr perspective that they were hitting towards the falls and it decided to take off, but it wouldn't let go of the fish, and the fish had frozen to the ice floe. And it kept trying to get away, and the eagle would not let go. And at this point now, its talons had frozen into the fish, and the witnesses watched the eagle go off the falls with the fish and the ice and was destroyed below. A lot of people are like that. They keep thinking, yeah, I want to fly, I want to go to heaven, but we don't let go and let God. And that's what he's waiting for. There's no limit to what the Lord can do for you if you'll let go. If you will be turned upside down by the Lord so that you are empty, he can then fill you. The reason the Lord cannot fill us is because we're so full of other things. There's no limit to what God can do with us and in us and through us if we would be available to him. But our lives are so full. You know what, friends? You will, to the same degree you empty yourself, to that degree you will be filled with God and his spirit. I thought love was more important than obedience, isn't it? No. You demonstrate love by obedience. It's like the drunk had a very patient wife and he'd come home in the middle of the night and she'd get upset and she'd lock him out and he'd stand there by the front door and he'd start bellowing, I love you, dear. Open the door. And all the neighbors could hear and she'd get embarrassed and eventually open the door. Night after night, he'd come and he'd stand there and he'd pound on the front door and he'd call up, dear, three little words, I love you, I love you. And she'd give in and open the door and let him in. This worked for a long time. But finally, she got fed up. One night, he came home drunk and he's pounding on the door and she locked the door and he stood out there and bellowed a long time, three little words, I love you. She opened the window and shouted out, I got two words for you, prove it. Shut the window. If you really love somebody, you don't just say, I love you, God, I love you, God. Prove it. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll pray the Father, and he'll send you the Holy Spirit. Do you know that's a prerequisite for being filled with the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's a tremendous power that he gives to those that are willing to obey. Number 13, but I always thought that true freedom in Christ released me from obedience, doesn't it? As long as we love the Lord, I mean, that's all that matters. Just love God. And you know, I've often heard people say, Doug, you're putting people under these old commandments. Jesus gave us new commandments. He said, a new commandment I give unto you. We don't have that old law anymore. The new commandment, love the Lord, love your neighbor. 
when Jesus said that, he was quoting Moses. How old can you get? Jesus said it's a new concept for you that the Ten Commandments are summed up in loving the Lord with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. But loving God and loving your neighbor does not do away with the other commandments. If you love the Lord and you love your neighbor, you will keep those commandments. A lady had a brother that was an alcoholic. And through years of drinking, George wore out his body. The doctor said his kidneys were shot. And unless he had a transplant, you know, you can live with one kidney, he was doomed. Well, there was nobody willing to donate a good kidney. The hospitals don't put him on the top of the list for donors, and he was going to die. He had a loving sister who was a Christian, very dedicated single lady. Turned out she had the same blood type. She said, of course, I'll give George one of my kidneys. He's my brother. I love him. Well, they did the surgery, and things went okay for George. His body accepted her kidney, and it began to function and operate, and... Uh, while he was in recovery, they said, well, you're doing okay, but we've got some bad news. Your sister had an allergic reaction to the anesthetic, and for some reason, it's affected her nervous system, and she's paralyzed, and we think it's permanent. From the neck down, she could not move. Well, that was devastating for her. But she said, how's George? Your brother's doing well. We think he's going to make it. Well, she felt the sacrifice was worthwhile. But how do you think she felt when a few days after... He was finally released from the hospital. The very first place he went was to the bar. How do you think Jesus feels when after he died to save us from sin, we say, thanks, Lord, and we run back to our sin? He didn't die to save us in sin. He died to save us from sin. Amen? Because sin is what hurts you. And when we run back to the thing that hurts us after he died to save us from it, oh, it really hurts him then. He died to save us from sin, not in sin, friends. Number 14. When I believe God requires a certain thing, shouldn't I obey? Should I obey even though I don't understand why? Yep. Every commandment you obey has a blessing connected with it. Don't wait until you understand everything. If you know what God is asking you to do, do it. So many people, I'll meet them, you know, and they'll say, yeah, that's very interesting. I'm going to have to study this, and I'm, I'm not sure I understand all the aspects of why God wants us to do this, and, and they use intelligence as a diversionary tactic for surrender. They think as long as they're thinking about the will of the Lord that somehow that's a substitute for doing it. Now, I've got a three-year-old boy. And I say, you do not get off the curb into the street. He may not understand all of the, uh, you know, mechanisms of internal combustion engines. So what I do is I walk him over to a squashed bug. And I see that, see that bug? I said, that's what you'll look like if a car runs you over. That's called fear. It's healthy if it means saving your children. He looked a long time at that squashed bug. I impressed that in his mind. He doesn't understand everything about playing in the street and the dangers, but you know what? He was running out just the other night. When it was raining, he had an umbrella. He wanted to try it out. He followed me out even though he was supposed to go home with mom. He went running outside. He saw me cross the street. He ran up to the curb, and I am so thankful that we've impressed that. He ran up to the curb, and he went like this. Something was on automatic, and a car went by right then. He didn't understand all the details of why I say do not get off the curb. But you need to obey anyway. Friends, your heavenly Father has good reasons even if you don't understand them. And be sure your salvation is at the heart of that. Amen? Your protection, your blessing. Obey. You'll always be better off. Any commandment you obey, you'll be blessed by it. Number 15. Who's behind all disobedience and why? The devil. He that committeth sin is of the devil. The devil sins from the beginning. The devil is constantly going to give you arguments and rationalizations why it doesn't matter to obey God. Did you hear me? The devil is very creative. He'll give you a hundred arguments and reasons why obedience isn't really important. A rationalization for every sin. He's got one. And don't, don't talk to him. If God says do something, do it. Don't rationalize with the devil. He was able to convince Eve to do the very opposite of what God had said. Number 16, what glorious promise regarding a super miracle does the Bible give God's children? He which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, friends, I realize I've said some things tonight that are pretty strong. But you know why? It's because God loves you and He wants you to be saved. Sin is deadly. 
A number of years ago, a passenger train stalled. The engine failed on a very busy track. Well, they called to the switch. They said, send a flagman and stop another train that was oncoming. A flagman was sent to this intersection. He waved the red flag that was to indicate that this train was to stop so it would not collide with a passenger train. But instead of stopping, it just slowed down a little bit and went on by and slammed into the passenger train a few miles down the road. Several people died. This is a true story. The conductor saw the collision coming. He put the brakes all the way on and jumped from the train. When they interviewed him, they said, didn't you see the red flag? Weren't you supposed to stop? He said he didn't have a red flag. He said he had a yellow flag. Yellow means slow down. And it turned out the flag that was once supposed to be red through neglect, been left out in the sun and the rain and the elements had been bleached and it had turned kind of an amber yellow. There's a lot of people out there that are preaching a yellow gospel, friends. And if you keep getting a yellow gospel, you're going to crash. The gospel is that Jesus came to save you from sin. Sin will kill you. He wants to save you from sin, and he's able to do it. My God, and what I know, is big enough to do it because he's doing it for me, friends, and he can do it for you, and he can do it for you too. Friends, find a pen and take down our 800 number and mailing address. We have a wonderful free gift that goes right along with what you're seeing and hearing today. It's the beautifully illustrated complimentary study guide. Our operators are standing by for your call at 800-835-6906. Make certain you give the title of today's study when you phone. And by all means, write us at Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Look for this address again at the end of today's telecast. Offer good in the U.S., Canada, and U.S. territories. Friends, I hope you're learning new things from today's study. If you are, I'd like very much to hear from you. I treasure each one of your cards, your letters, your words of encouragement, your comments, and especially your prayer requests. Our office staff at Amazing Facts gathers every day to pray over each one of them. If you'd like to know more about how to obtain this video series, you can call us or write. The address is Amazing Facts, P.O. Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. And our toll-free number is 1-800-835-6906. Why don't you give us a call or write us a letter? God bless you, and I thank you in advance.